In this video, we'll learn what Venn diagrams are and what the basic rules are for them. So because you're dealing with categorical syllogisms, we're still dealing with your A, E, I, and O statements in standard form, just like you did before. Except now, we're going to represent each one of the three terms that are repeated, the major, the minor, and the middle terms, with three circles that interlock. So you'll draw your first circle at the top here, and that will stand for M, or whatever the middle term is for that argument. There's a second circle here that stands for S, or the minor term of your argument, and then a third circle for the major term of the argument. In these three interlocking circles, you can see on page 267 of your book that there are four separate portions. One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Each one of these represents a different area that can be filled in using the premises. There are a few rules that you should know for Venn diagrams. Rule number one, no marks are made for the conclusion. So just like when you were working with proofs, you're not going to actually use the conclusion as part of what you're working with. You are instead going to use it as a reference. So no marks are made for the conclusion. Marks are only made for the premises. Number two, and these won't be exactly the same as in your textbook. I'm abbreviating some of them, but you can again take a look at pages 267 and 268 in your textbook if you want a lengthier explanation. Your book, for example, for the second rule for Venn diagrams says that if the argument contains one universal premise, then you have to enter it in first. So you'll remember out of the A, E, I, and O statements, the A and the E are both universal statements. You would remember this from proofs, and the I and the O statements are particular. So if in your Venn diagram, between the two premises, you have one universal and one particular, you will enter in the universal premise first and the particular one second. If they are both universal or if they are both particular, it won't matter which one you've entered in first. So we'll say enter in universal premises before particulars. If the premises are both universal or both particular, it does not matter which one you put in first. Now, the next rule that I'll share with you is that when making marks,
for the premises. Universal premises use shading, whereas particular premises use an X. I'm going to move this diagram up a little bit just so that I can show you how that works out. The fourth rule, and we've skipped one from your book, is that when you're shading an area, you have to be careful to shade all of the area in question. So you'll notice that if you look at all of this, or this entire larger Venn diagram, these particular ways that it's broken up starts to make sense. For example, if you were looking at shading all the area in question, which is one of the rules, you'll always either be dealing with a smaller portion or what I like to call unofficially an I or a larger per portion of a circle which will always look like this. We can call that unofficially a Pac-Man or the larger portion. Okay. So if you take a look you can see that in the larger Venn diagram every part is made up of either an I or a larger part, or a Pac-Man. You see with like the little mouth there. So for instance, areas four and seven make up the larger part of the P circle, whereas areas three and six make up the I, or the smaller part. Areas one and four make up the larger part of the M circle when it's facing this way, just like the P circle could be facing this way, or it could be facing this way and the larger part could be six and seven and the I could be three or four. Each one of these works at least twice for each term. So again, the middle term, the larger portion could either be one and two and the I could be three and four, or it could be areas one and four and the I could be two and three. It's gonna rotate depending on which one you're looking at because Another rule, before we get back to shading everything in question, is that you're only ever dealing with two circles at a time. So you're only ever going to be looking at M and S, or M and P, or S and P, or P and S. So you're only ever dealing with two at a time, you ignore that third circle. And I'll elaborate on that in another video. So here, you'll notice that each one of the larger portions is gonna be intersected or bisected by a third part of the circle. So, when you're asked to shade the larger portion or the eye of a particular Venn diagram, you have to shade the whole thing, ignoring that third circle. Like this or like this. You just ignore that line from the third circle. And then the last one is, because each one of them are divided into two parts. The last one is, if you are entering an X, that X goes into that same line. On the line that bisects the area you are working with.
So for example, if you were looking at just this, or just this, as in the previous example, where this is a larger part of a circle and this is the line of the third circle that we're ignoring, you would put the X here or here on the line if it is empty. If it is not empty, if part of it is shaded, then you would put the X in the open spot. So again, if it's empty, then you put the X on that line from the third circle that bisects it to show that we don't know which side it's in. If it's shaded, which is why we put universal premises in first, because universal premises use shading and particular ones use an X, if it was shaded already in one part, then you put the X in the empty spot. In the next video, I'll show you how this works with actual problems.